All right, hello, and thank you for joining us today for this Davo 2021 presentation with a group of panelists that I'm very excited to present to you on the business of art and the art of business. Uh, but be sure to stay with us towards the, at the end of the today, I have a great announcement about funding opportunities for independent working artists that'll be coming through the county. And I wanna make that announcement at the end of today. Um, my name is Mark Friday. I'm the director of Dane County Arts and Cultural Affairs, also known as Dane Arts, which rests in the heart of county government. I have the pleasure of serving within the executive office and I report directly to county executive Joe Parisi, who I actually haven't seen since February of 2020, but I do report to him. The mission of uh, Dane Arts is to support the arts history and culture of Dane County, and it's my job to raise the visibility of the arts to make sure that we recognize the economic, cultural, creative, and uh, community impact the arts generate across all arenas. It is the reason 72% of corporate America CEOs say they want two things that they need out of their employees. They need them to be creative and innovative. And I have an MBA in finance from the great UW Madison, and there is nothing creative about finance. So it's all about the arts. So thank you for being with us. I'm invite, very excited to have this remarkable group of panelists um, who will be presenting the incredible art that they present throughout Dane County. And they have saved us throughout this pandemic. I'm so grateful for their time today. Um, firstly, let me thank the Dabble team of coordinator Sarah Okawa, uh, who's coordinating Dabble 2021, Olivia Wisden, uh, and Adalia Hernandez Abrego, who's been my LTE for the past 18 months, but she is leaving Dane Arts uh, after she graduates from the MA program in the Bowles administration at UW Madison. Uh, she'll leave after May 8th, and I want to thank her for her time. She's been extremely important to uh, helping facilitate Dane Arts. But before we meet the panelists, I want to introduce the most, intel most talented songwriter, performer, producer, director, my good friend, who I just love very much because of her work. I want Beth Killey to start us off with a song by Beth Killey. Stronger 
Beth, thank you so much. You're absolutely brilliant sound. I really love your work. Um, I'm just so proud you have a few moments, moments to be with us, Beth. So thank you for your song. Beth is a producer, manager, director, all around an incredible artist. She runs, like many artists, several projects at one time. Now her own Beth Kelly band. I'm sure you play with other musicians as, and as a soloist like you are here today. I know that you also are organizers of the MAMAs, the Madison Area Music Awards. And of course, you're the founder and director of Girls Rock Camp, which is really introducing young people to the glory of being involved in music. So thank you, Beth. You're certainly welcome to participate in the conversation at any time. We'll come back to you about halfway through this for another song, but thank you so much, Beth. And thank you to our three panelists that we have today. Uh, I'm so thrilled to have them. Madison Museum of Contemporary Arts, Gabriel Haberman, uh, new executive director, Christina Brungart, who is in from Houston. Uh, CEO, also new, Joe Lanus from the Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra and a good friend from way back, APT, American Players Theater, artistic director, Brenda DeVita. In our short time today, I hope to cover a couple sections that we can discuss about your vision for the work and then lines with the mission statement of your organization, a little bit about the pandemic and how it's impacted your work, uh, the community and the arts, and of course, uh, how we're dealing with diversity, equity, inclusion in the arts today at these arts organizations. All three of you are relatively new to your positions uh, and already have a tremendous impact in the community as I meet and talk with others who are getting to know the three of you. But can each of you share with us a little bit about your history and professional background? And I'm gonna go with you, Brenda, because I've known you since our days at the Milwaukee Repertory Theater about years ago. And I'm really appreciated, she had no, <laughs> so, uh, really, <laughs> a box you say about, 50 pounds ago for me. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> but if you could just share a little bit about your background and your work here at APT, sure. and then of course we'll go to uh, Christina and Joe. So thank you. Thank you so much for having us here today, Mark. And thank you for all of your work. Really hear that. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, hi, I'm Brenda DeVita. I'm the Artistic Director at American Players Theater. I've been the Artistic Director for about seven seasons now. I've been with APT 27 seasons. So I've been here, um, I, thank you for reminding me there was a time before APT, Mark, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I grew up here. I grew up, uh, I grew up learning about this area and how to serve this area. Um, I'm a director as well as an artistic director, but um, mostly I find my job to be uh, really about support. I work for the people who work for me. Honestly, that's how it feels to me. Um, I went to school at the University of Northern Iowa, the BFA program. I was out at Easton at the University of Delaware before I, as an actor for a long time before I came here. Um, and I made my home here and fell in love with Southwest Wisconsin. And there's really nothing like Dane County. I, I, I joke about it. It's the most overeducated city in America and it, it's really good audience. <laughs> because they really know how to, they really are interested in learning and listening and they're very very supportive about the art so yeah I, i've been here for a long time and i hope to be here for a little while longer thanks thank you Chris, christina thank you so much for having us all to be on this panel today i think it's such an important topic especially right now but any time in the arts to talk about the art of business uh, my name is christina brungard i'm the gabrielle haberlin director of madison museum of contemporary art and mocha for some, mamoka for others. Uh, so I'm learning, learning about that. Uh, I am most recently from Houston, Texas, where I served as the interim director and the deputy director at the Contemporary Arts Museum, Houston. Um, but I have an interesting background because I have also taught at universities and also worked in galleries. So I've been on a few different sides of the art world. And I'd like to say I've done it all from serving as a gallery attendant to uh, looking at the financials on a daily basis. Um, initially, when I came into the arts, though, I started on the financial side. I was a finance manager for the Neue Gallery in New York uh, Museum of German and Austrian Art, which had a very wonderful mission. And uh, I really love working, though, with living artists and learning what they do and finding out ways to support them. So I'm very honored to be at MMOCA and be in Madison because it's such a wonderful thriving arts community with so many incredible people that are supporting the arts here. And you're an art historian, correct? 
Oh, yes, I'm also an art historian. So my focus in uh, art history is actually art and politics. So another good reason to be in Madison, because looking at the nexus between how artists express themselves in relation to the world that's happening around them is so critical and so important. Thank you, Christina, for being here. And Joe, tell us about you. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Mark, thank you so much for setting this up. And Brenda and Christina, nice to serve alongside you today on this panel. Um, I'm a, was a CEO of the Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra. My first day was September 1st, 2019. So I've been on board for about a year and a half. Uh, my journey and background, I'm a Wisconsin native and um, got my cello performance degree from Lawrence University up in Appleton. Uh, had the good fortune of auditioning for and getting into the Green Bay Symphony at uh, age 16. So I was playing um, orchestral um, symphony at, uh, in high school and beyond, played it through college. When I got out of college, I actually chased my dream of playing uh, golf on the PGA Tour. So I spent um, six or seven winters down in Florida playing on the mini tours. And I say that because it was down there that I in fact found sort of what I thought Think my calling is and that's to use my passions and, and help and serve communities and others. I opened up a teaching studio um, teaching kiddos cello while I was also trying to get on the PGA Tour and I fast fell in love with this idea of taking a passion of mine and, and helping and elevate kids in that, in that service. So that sort of was sort of an anchoring point for me. So when I moved back to Madison in 2013, um, I was fortunate to get a job as executive director of First Tee, which is a youth development organization empowering kiddos through golf. I did that for six years. And um, during that time, got my MBA. And this opportunity at the Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra came up uh, right when I got out of my graduate program. And it just seemed very serendipitous that I had this opportunity to try to lead another organization with my, with my passion. And um, so I feel very fortunate to be here. and. Um, yeah, it's been quite a journey since September, but um, I'm very, very thankful to be a part of this community and all of the rich art that it has. Thank you, Joe. I often say that uh, uh, sports and arts go together, which I label sparts, because every great actor has to sing, dance, and act, and that takes incredible athletic abilities. And most great athletes have taken ballet, although many of them call it movement. So it is a combination of sports and arts. So you, you bring a wealth of experience to your position. So thank you. But what I find most exciting about the three of you, among many things, is the energy and visions that you bring to your work. And I know that we have the mission statements of your three organizations up on the board right now. And we know that mission statements, we hope, should align to the vision of the organization. So I'd like to say whether or not, you know, how you align your vision to the missions. But I also know that, Brenda, you also provided us with a value statement of uh, some of the work that you've been doing related to your group. Can you just touch a little bit on these ABT yeah, values? absolutely. And I, I'll try to talk quickly because um, there's not a lot of time, but I do want to say that uh, at APT, the values are, are absolutely part and parcel with our, our mission. Our mission statement, as you saw, is about bringing uh, the largest audience possible to poetry and that we believe that poetry is transformative if it's actually in a narrative that people can connect to with their hearts, their minds, and their bodies at one time. So it's a, it, that, that everyone has a mission statement. It's about universality. And what we found um, about 15 years ago is that at APT, we, we really believe that how we do our art is as important as the art that we produce. That doesn't mean to diminish or to anything. It means to actually bump up the actual feeling about how, how we wanna be proud of how we end up at the end of the season how we feel about the way we created our art and how we feel about the way we treated each other and the way that we actually valued the community because it's very much a community. So um, the values became really important to us and they are um, driven by the entire organization. They, inter they interplay with our um, institution and they're incredibly important to all of us here. And every year we, re we re go through the values again with the entire organization, anybody can comes that comes in and we rewrite them. And in the last two or three iterations since I became artistic director, they have interplayed with our, our EDI or anti-racism documents in order for them all to be of support to one another. So they're not just documents that are out there in the world, they are APT. Our values are, are our mission statement, our mission statement is our EDI work and that they all support each other. So they sound like things that would be very, very simple, but if we do them all, we find that we have a much stronger, um, a much stronger community and therefore much and much healthier artists. And then we have 
better art. It's not just a good idea. It's good business. So I remember when I said to David Frank, we need to codify some of these things that we think is magical about APT. You hear that APT is magic. And I'm like, it's a lot of hard work to be magical. So we need to talk about what that is and actually hold ourselves accountable and one another accountable in a way that is completely open to me being held accountable by the people that work for me right. continually every day, not just once a year. So um, this is our, this is the way we operate. This is the way we try to operate every day. So I just wanted to share that because it's, it's as, as important as our mission. Well, I know I'm going to go off my list of questions here, but what's important as well is that we have two women leading major arts organizations in Dane County for the first time. You have APT, which has you, Brenda, and then you have the, the managing director. Ah, and their name's escaping me right now. I don't know why I talk to her all the time. Your managing director of APT Oh, is Carrie Van Halgren. Carrie, yes. Carrie, Carrie, right. Two women leading major arts organization, and already things are happening. Christina, I'm going to have high expectations as well, and it's brilliant that we have women leading these organizations because you bring a whole different mindset to how to produce the art. So thank you for the work that you're doing. My idea of a mission statement is a compelling value and mission that can be translated in goals and strategies that can only be worked as initiatives to promote and generate results. You know, and while we face these major challenges today, can you share how your visions align with your mission and maybe describe your leadership style in the process? We can go with Christina, then Joe, Brenda. Sounds great, thank you. Uh, I will actually say the mission was one of the things that drew me to the organization because they have a mission statement and they have a vision statement. And there is one piece in there, and I don't think it's actually in this section of it, but it says to provide transformative experiences. And to me, that is the heart of what we do. And that opens us up to think about what those transformative experiences can be and how we can reach beyond our walls to create those transformative experiences. And it's one of the things that I think is so incredibly important about what museums are doing right now is that we need to think beyond the white box. We need to think, what are we doing in the community and what can the community do when they come to us? So we've been doing a lot to think about how, how we change how museums have historically been seen. And it's something that I, I started thinking a lot about when I was teaching. I would have students who did not feel comfortable. I myself did not feel comfortable going into museums when I was a kid and thinking about what messaging we're saying, how do we make it part of the community? Because sometimes it feels like it's a very separate thing. And until you think about how you create that transformative experience, sometimes that transformative experience is just walking in the door. Uh, sometimes it's just sitting with a piece of artwork. Sometimes it's meeting the artist. Sometimes it's having an artist go to school. So. To me, that's what I think about every day when I come to work. How are we forming transformative experiences? And, and that completely aligns with the way I've always thought about art. And so when I saw that in the mission statement and the vision statement at, at MOCA, I knew this was a great place to be because after talking with people, I realized it's not something they're just putting there in the statement. They believe it. They feel it. It's who they are, just like what Brenda was saying. It is built into the core of every person who works here and how they want to approach art. Um, and we've been thinking about different ways to approach it as we move forward. You know, The thing that's happened in the last year is we've had time to reflect and think, how can we do things differently? How can we become a transformative experience after the pandemic? So that's something we really think about a lot. And it's, so I haven't had to try and shift my, my vision to a mission. I actually made sure the mission felt comfortable when I came here. So. Oh. Yeah, Christina, the uh, transformative experience is certainly a theme here at Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra. You know, I, when we think about our vision, it's we talk a lot about transformative experiences through the power of music. So exactly resonates with what you said in terms of art generally. And, you know, we all had our own experiences listening to Beth's wonderful music, but in a way it kind of transports you, right? It, it puts you to a higher place. I was taking my kiddos to daycare today and, you know, my one and four in the back are just doing this when we're listening to... Um, two cellos play um, Thunderstruck, which is a fun cello duet. But um, yeah, it's, I think I kind of took for granted coming into this position that um, what, a, what a challenge and honor it is to steward, you know, an arts mission and vision in a community because I came up through music 
But when the pandemic hit and we had a really difficult 2020s, uh, racial injustices, the, the, the lockdown, it made me really evaluate and reaffirm like why I show up every day to do this. I mean, this is a very important thing for us to do for our community and that's create opportunities for people to plug into and reach beyond themselves, whether it's listening to music, going to the museum. So, you know, you, you talked about community, you know, I think where orchestras need to do a better job is, I think it's been directional for so long um, where we, we have this belief that people can come to us and people can experience us. And I think what we're finding in the industry is that we have to step out of that mindset. And this is a holistic experience between communities and audiences and our educational spaces. So I think when I think of transformative experiences through the power of music, it takes on a whole new meaning when you think about the sustainability of an orchestra, but more importantly, how can you make that transformative experience for everybody? It's not always us receiving, it's us finding ways to get out in the community and meeting the needs of everybody. So um, Mark, you, you touched on like leadership styles a bit. You know, I, when I was thinking about this, what I'm trying to focus on and what I think is really important is th there's a level of authenticity that is inherent upon any leadership position, especially as you're trying to be expansive. So I think a lot about that every day. Like, am I being authentic to myself, to my team, to my constituencies? And then also like this idea of being a connector. Um, it's so important, especially now as we're sort of hopefully in this revival and renewal phase of, of the pandemic. I mean, it's so important to just to be a good listener and, and to connect your organization and the stakeholders to everybody that's in your community so that you're not missing opportunities to bring people into what you're, what you're trying to, to create for people. Thank you, thank you, Brenda. Sorry about that. I touched a little bit on leadership style. I guess um, I will, I'll expand on what you're all talking about as far as authenticity. Like I seriously am about the people that we attract. And what I realized when I became, and I was our associate artistic director for many, many years and casting director for many years and uh, before becoming artistic director. And the big thing that I was um, always saying is that um, like what we do at APT isn't noble. It's just, it's what we do. We actually be are really believe in the idea of story and it being something that we all run to to figure out who we are and why we are and what we want to be or what we don't want to be. So that idea of story, but, and also the idea of universality. So I was really stuck on this idea of universality. Everyone says that they want a universal story that everyone as a human being can attach to. But I kept wondering why the universality that we thought about Shakespeare, that like Hamlet, if you do it well, if you do it well and somebody doesn't like it, it's because you didn't do it well. So um, then look back harder at what you're missing about the humanity, right? And, um, but universality became a really driving focus for me because um, I've always been blessed to be able to be at the table here because they would take anybody who overworked themselves and would work for nothing and happen to be that kind of pal. And, um, but I also understood that most of the people sitting around that table deciding what was universal with very generous hearts all looked the same. All looked the same. We all were educated to basically in the same. I mean, I'm from, I have I'm from a farm, so I held that up as some kind of like I grew up on a farm with 15 siblings. So I, I'm not Ivy League elite. So, but it didn't matter because ultimately, we had the same value system. Potentially, we had the same ideas about why it was important, and it had a, a bit of elitism to it that I was really interested in knocking down, and really interested in understanding if we're going to have a universal story that's actually going to be experienced by everyone in the audience. We can't all look and feel the same about what that means. So that became a, a compelling, and I'm also kind of a player coach. Um, everyone would say I kind of, I kind of, I lead by being a kind of a player coach. And I think that that's the, that's the feeling of the organization. I think a lot is that I think other artistic directors sometimes are a bit appalled by my accessibility. Um, um, sometimes I think my kids wish I wasn't as accessible, but I do believe that it is about a value system of listening, valuing, hearing, Ex and really being transparent, like really why that thing's not happening. Not even if I wish it were, like when it can, how it can, and being accountable for when it can. So um, I'm big on a lot of feedback, a lot. We have a lot of 
a lot of feedback loops, a lot of affinity groups, a lot of places where people feel safe to talk. Um, and that's been in the last five or six years that that's become really clear to me that that is the future. That is the future of our other next set of leaders here, the next core company. We have to have a more, a more universal idea about what is important to being expanding the human ex experience of understanding it. So that's a lot of words. How's that? Thank you, all three of you, for your comments. It's so right on and so refreshing as an old dude who's been in this business over 40 years to, to finally hear some of the same conversations, but see it actions actually taking place. So I appreciate that. Now, it's been a really intense year for you three and for all of us. Uh, how have you been able to keep your organization connected to your audiences? You know, in other words, what, what would be your pandemic takeaway after the experience this year of a pandemic? Anybody can jump in. I'll jump in. Uh, the number one takeaway is, I always ask myself, are we spending our mission critical dollars, time, time, talent, treasure buckets? always are they being spent mission critical? And before the pandemic, you ask yourself that question, but during the pandemic, you, you have to ask with every single thing you do, is this what we're about? Is this a transformative experience? How does it lead to that transformative experience? And actually, I think it helped me to the point of Brenda and Joe, when I get up in the morning, I think, why do I do this? Why do I love this? Why do I embrace this? This is a hard year. Why does my staff do that? Why does the community support us the way they do? And if, if you keep that feeling with you every single day, with every single action you do with your organization, it's my takeaway. And it actually has reaffirmed why I do what I do, why I love what I do, and why I probably am also way too much time and accessibility that probably drives a few people insane. I'm you know, always reachable. And I always tell people, please, don't worry, you don't have to email me back at midnight. <laughs> so, uh, but it's it's my main takeaway. And also in this this year, it really has has helped in a lot of ways organizations get back to who they are and really think about what's important, not just as an organization, but as an organization that's part of a community. And a big part of that. Joe, Brenda, do you have anything about the pandemic and a takeaway or? Reaching new audiences in this pandemic or sustaining audiences? Yeah, I, I, I echo everything Christina said about it really challenged us to, you know, reach back as to why we exist, why we wake up, put on our shoes every day and come to work. Um, and it, it, really, it really oriented us to think about the constituencies we serve, which are the audience members, the donors, and the artists. And I think our position was, let's find a way to keep doing something that's meaningful. And we were in a position to actually create something new and to sort of place small bets on what the future might look like for the industry. We, um, so in terms of how we present our concerts, how we provide behind the scenes look, you know, one of the things that we're Looking at now and what we've sort of learned in the last year, at least in the orchestra world, there's this sort of, when, you're, when you think about a, a classical music concert, there's, this, there's the audience and there are the players. There isn't sort of, there's a, there's a dialogue, but it's nonverbal and there's sort of this, this wall. And I think what the pandemic has really educated us up on is the experience of our, of our customers and of our audience members can be so much more. We, uh, so we started um, finding ways to shrink the gap by, by featuring our musicians in new ways that doesn't have to do with the music. Like what's their story? Why do they get up every morning? Why have they put in 30,000 hours to be a professional musician? Um, and I think we found that the audience really appreciates that connectivity that they may not have gotten prior to the pandemic when maybe that wasn't sort of a mainstay of, of how we present ourselves. So. Yeah, just, you know, the two main things for me, as Christina said, like, why do we do what we do? And then how do we get that audience member and the customer closer to why we do this? Because um, it just enriches the experience for everybody. Thank you. And I think most people really appreciate wanting to see behind the scenes how this 
comes together. You said it earlier, I think, Brenda, that you make it look so easy that anybody can do it, but they're not there for the eight months of hard work to make it look easy. So mm -hmm. tell, share us with us, Brenda, a little bit on APT and the pandemic. It, and it's very funny away. because everything you guys just said, Joe and Christina, I, I um, it's funny. We found out like, you know, the weekend we're supposed to have our design conference weekend, which all the designers, all the directors, we bring them old school, bring them all here. We go through all the designs to make sure we, they're feasible and, and, and we are on track to build because we start the five shows in May, right? And then the, the rest of them in August. So it's a big machine. And we find out that weekend, we, we're all shut down. And then we have to cancel the season. They're like the, like the week we're supposed to be selling tickets, right? And, I, and I, I have to say, my first thought was, Oh, this poor audience, because when we sell tickets, they come online and they are cra they're crazy. They buy a bazillion tickets the first day and crash our system and all that stuff. And we love them for it. They're, they're rabid. Um, but I thought, oh my gosh, this is summer. This is what they think. This is, this is terrifying for us and them for so many reasons. But also I immediately thought artists. And when you say, why do we come to work every day? It is absolutely, to me, been very clear for a long time that it's about the artists. So we immediately, the minute PPP came in, I said, we need to produce now. We need to produce now. We need to get artists back to work. We need to be artists, 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 artists focused. So putting things out there for the audience. So we did all those things. We did 17 um, different productions last year um, in different ways on our property, walks through the woods, and but then all the stuff on Zoom everybody was doing. But it was all about and motivated by connecting the artists and the audience. And then we did a series of interviews, like you said, Joe, we did a series of interviews on the porch. I interviewed everybody on my porch with cocktails, thanks, with cocktails about, uh, about why APT, these artists, all the actors in the core company. And it just, it just completely, and we had one more thing that was amazingly important, which was we had been working on uh, a lot of training with um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and a lot of anti-racism training the last five years, and um, work with Sarah Bellamy from Penumbra Theater, focused our work with her. And um, this, th this thing, this pandemic, I know we all have felt it, but it became s s critical that we learn how to decentralize our whiteness in our, in, our in, in our industry, in our world. And that became a focus that we had time for in a very different way. And focus and a commitment and kind of cracking open that happened that we do uh, have been doing now for um, years, but this last 12 months have been really, really important in that work and really, really, really hard and really great. But that, that's also something that became very clear when we come out of this, we wanna come out of this ahead. We don't wanna come out of this like trying to paddle to keep up. We wanna we want to come out of this ahead so that it is an equitable place and an equitable space for everyone, all the artists that work here and all the people who come. So that was a really big boon of the, uh, I should say big boon of the pandemic. I tried to look to all the, all the good stuff that could happen. Those things were all, all good things. Wow, that's, uh, we're going to go to Beth Kelly for a second song, but I just want to emphasize that uh, I have seen the most creative work come in from so many different artists during this pandemic, finding new ways to approach their work, learning new skills, you know, just doing whatever is necessary. And that's the beauty. I always say hire an artist because you're going to hire an expert in the field of the art that that person creates, but also the job that pays the bills. You know, they have to have these jobs. And many artists right now have gone in the service industry, you're losing that second and third job because that industry has been decimated. But I'm just so excited that all of you are putting artists at the forefront of all your thinking. And when I say artists, we're talking about musicians, dancers, theaters, producers, everybody that's producing this creative work. And speaking of creative, I want to go back to Beth Kelly for one more song if she is still with us. I'm Beth, still you with here. Us? All right, here. knock it out, Beth. <laughs> So this next song is called Lean. I wrote it with my friend Shondell Marks. We have a trio uh, with our other friend Jen Farley. And collectively, we are called Gin, Chocolate, and Bottle Rockets. <laughs> and uh, this song is about leaning in to everything and the consequences of not doing that. So when it gets ugly, you just gotta lean. Slapped your wrist when you slammed the door Told you, girl, don't you make a scene They laughed when the music made you cry And at the times you had to dance and sing You 
heard that the girls meant for Christ, so you stifled every scream. You'd be giving them the upper hand if they saw your moment of weakness. But their words faithfully don't fall apart. Don't let them see where you held back. Kept your head. What about your heart? What about your heart? You can't hear my snappy fingers because I'm an old dude, but I was younger. Yeah, click, 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 click. Nice, beautiful, Beth. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. Phew. Beth Kelly, ladies and gentlemen, um, one, of, one of the most amazing artists here in Dane County. So thank you for your work, Beth. Um, back to the panelists. You three run major businesses. I like to call them businesses because they are a business. And from different perspectives, disciplines, theater, music, visual arts, Businesses in the business world are always trying to solve problems. That's what businesses do. So what problems are you trying to solve within your own business? Joe, Christina, Brenda, what problems are you trying to solve? Not do you have any. See, there aren't any. Joe, I talk you too start? much. I talk too much. So somebody else start. I talk way too much. Talking, Brenda. Okay, Joe, are you going or me? Go ahead. 
I'll, I'll follow <laughs> after you. He's, he's ready to um, go. Go ahead. I, kind of, I mean, if we're looking at what problems we're trying to solve, um, I, I, I wrote a thing the other night and I said, you know, I felt like the last, uh, I don't know, 10 years of, before the pandemic, we were like looking at our feet. And we just started being able to look like a few feet out ahead of us. Like it felt 2019 felt like, a, it feels like 10 years ago, but it was like artistically one of the most satisfying years that we've ever had here. It was the most diverse. It was the most um, communal community that felt much, very much aligned with one another's needs. And, and uh, it was just a really, and I thought I got to quit now because it was a good year as well financially. So all of those things kind of aligning, I'm like, I should go. And then the pandemic hit. And I think the big thing we're trying to figure out is how not to uh, go back to our feet, right? And um, and to, and to convey the need for us to keep looking out towards the horizon. And that horizon is very different than it was pre-pandemic, or, or I should say before I became artistic director, I kept seeing that horizon shifting and changing and not being afraid of that. And I think that the big challenges we have as a, as a, a classical company, which we've tried to say classical has its own problems in some ears. And so we're trying to like, as a company that tells these big stories, how are we translating ourselves? How are we making ourselves available? And how are we, um, how are we serving communities that have never felt that we have kept ourselves from? Geographically, dr dramaturgically, um, our, our systems and the way that we hire and the way that we think about hiring, the way, all of it, we've been just, and I think that that is the future and how we understand that not to be afraid of that because it makes economic sense if you, if you can get big enough and think far enough, it makes economic sense. Because when my kids were in high school, my daughter sat next to me and, and she said, this is great, mom. I love APT. It's like in my bones. I love it here. And I can't bring any of my friends here because none of them look like some of them up there. And she was like 14 or something or 15. And I was like, yeah, you love APT and you don't want to bring your friends. That's a problem for the future. So that was big. And so it, it's about getting out of the fear of what that means. The fear that, that, uh, that everything's going to get scarce instead of abundant. And I, and I just, every, every time we can lean into the idea that more is better, not more is less. Um, I don't know. I'm talking too much. That, that's what we're, that's, that's the problems we're trying to solve is how we become a, a, more, a more statewide organization of service to more people than the people that we love and serve now and will continue to but how we become better at, at the rest of it. And out of the mouth of babes, right? Out of the mouth of our children to keep us on task. Brilliant, brilliant. And she's totally accurate. Right on, right on. Joe, what do you got? What do you got? What problem are you trying to solve at Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra? Yeah, I think, you know, Brenda, you hit on it. You know, what's in front of you? What's your horizon? Um, I think our industry is going through seismic disruption, you know, as it relates to Where's our positionality in the community? How do, you know, where, what are the small bets we need to place today that will prepare us for a future that we're not quite sure of? That's, that's one piece. So, you know, from a sheer business standpoint, you have to be somewhat strategic with, with what limited resources we have to place these bets that we can continue on and see, for example, like digital, um, how do you grow your audience base? What's the role between digital and live? I think those are sort of more of the tactical business problems we're trying to solve. But I think even larger than that, the, the problem I'm, that keeps me up at night is how do I reposition the role of an orchestra and community? And not just me as a small regional orchestra in the Midwest, but just orchestras in general. Um, because for so long, as, as you mentioned, Brenda, you know, we're, we're a classical art form that has this elitist aristocratic positionality in our minds. When I say orchestra, what do you think? And I think that's a major problem that every orchestra it, it is, it's this existential moment. So do we wanna be that arts organization who's entrenched in community that's finding ways to have unique collaborations so everyone can participate and we just happen to play classical music or do we continue to be this high art form that plays classical music come and hear us play? And I think the execution of that is the, the problem of our time. It's easy to say we're gonna do that, but to actually do it and what is the time horizon to do it and what bets you place today and effort you put in today to bear that fruit for five, 10, 20 years, that, 
that's the that's the problem we have to solve that's going to make this thing go for the next 100 200 300 years and i'm it's daunting you talk about how many earnings a week you have but to me everything links into that and um it's a big problem but what an opportunity to try and solve thank you joe and i'm going to completely reiterate what Joe and Brenda have just said it's it's an opportunity and there there's a reckoning upon arts organizations to think about how they're structured, how they came into being. And I think the the challenge is and the problem at times is taking apart every single piece, looking at it and making sure does this serve what we are trying to do to make a better, more equitable more open organization. And that, that I sometimes think is my biggest challenge in the middle of the night. And I know as an arts industry and my colleagues, we, we sit there and we struggle and worry that are we making good decisions? And with that, that has created a much better opportunity for us to also think about how we need to get outside of ourselves and just start asking people. <laughs> And that's one of the things that we're really figuring out. How do you go and ask people who, how are we impacting you? How are we part of your world? And especially as Brenda said, if they, they don't want to come and, and they don't feel comfortable in your space because you have a whole history as an arts organization, as museum structures have historically had of exclusion and it's an opportunity, but it's also a very daunting, challenging opportunity at the same time. Yes, indeed. It, it's certainly, and it's one worth undertaking. So I appreciate the three of you making that effort to do so. You know, Derek Johns, NAACP CEO and president of the NAACP, and this Sunday's, past Sunday's New York Times, a business section, talked about three things that were critically important to creating this change that you want to change for community and the arts and for better diversity, equity, and inclusion. He writes, you know, there are three things that you need to do to make a difference related to the changing demographics in this country. There has to be an honest review of the data, meaning you've got to put your, where you're putting your words, you've got to put your mouth there too. You've got to really step up and make that happen. He also says, number two, decision makers must reflect on the growth of its own. And in this case, for the, audi for the arts, it's audience, boards, C-suite, staff, he states that a lot of mistakes happen because others are not at the table and are not able to assist in the decisions that are culturally sensitive. And three, he say businesses have to move more, have to move to more diversity procurement, other opportunities for entrepreneurs, better pay. He writes that Henry Ford made a lot of mistakes, but the one thing he got right was making sure his employees could afford a Model T so he could sell more cars. So how are we doing that? It's about, a, it's about an impairment to engage in creating a just and equitable society. It's not about a char charity or a check, which is great, but about structural change that needs to take place. And I think all of you are doing that. Lenny Kravitz talks about the elephant in the room and he says the elephant in the room is racism. The fact that we are not addressing it. Uh, Ellen Rittenberg, a writer who talks also about racism and the elephant in the room and she says, you can't talk about the elephant in the room if all you're doing is looking at the ants. You know, so it is about that. And yeah. I want to have you all touch bases a little bit on this issue about inclusion diversity. We only have a few minutes left. I hope we have time for some questions, but could all three of you just give a little bit and we could follow up later at your websites on dealing with diversity, equity, and inclusion. I can start. I think, Mark, you hit on it. Um, our organization, we we're wrestling with, um, I think Brenda, you mentioned it, your, your group has done anti-racist training and we're evaluating our DEI task force. To what extent, what is the time horizon of this training? Um, where I come from, where I think about this is, to your point, Mark, there's a big elephant in the room and it requires education and understanding of the systems that have propped down and propped up different people in your art form. So we need, in order to decondition a system, we have to understand the system. So there's, there's this one part education that needs to happen, but then also this, um, not just 
your your programmatic um, envisioning, like the artistic direction, which our um, artistic director is really taking active steps to be more inclusive in his programming, Andrew Sewell. But where are your what is your policies around hiring? What what's your budget in terms of placing um, resources towards DEI efforts? Um, how are you looking at your vendor relationships? There are so many ways to think about this, um, but I think education is a big piece. We have to understand the pool we're swimming in first. And I think that's an investment that needs to happen. Christina, Brenda? Um, I'll, I'll go. Um, I think that the, I think that uh, everything, Joe, you said, I think that there's a lot of, um, what we're really trying to encourage is a lot of self learning. Um, a lot of uh, examination of our own um, our own racism, our bias, and and um, literally having forums and uh, spaces for uh, conversations about those things, as well as outside training and and guidance. But what we're learning now, after years of working internally, it's really and I've always, 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 always known this is if you is that it's a relationships, it's relationships, it's relationships, it's relationships, it's relationships. It's about listening, 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 and figure out what someone needs in order to feel as if they can contribute or and they can feel that where and what is it about the way we positioned ourselves? Yes, systemically. Yes, I was taught that from without knowing it. Um, positioned ourselves as organizations. We believe that the things that we do are, are are incredibly, like we said, transformative. And but understanding what transformative means, what universal means for real, takes an incredible amount of trust, an incredible amount of um, time and vulnerability. And all those words scare business people until they understand that honestly, in my experience. The only way we actually, actually make progress is inside that space. So inside of that space where we actually get down to it and say, yeah, you're afraid we could, I understand a company of actors afraid like if we do this, am I at the very core of it, am I still gonna be relevant? Do I still have work? And when you have to like really go into those conversations and say, let's talk about that. Let's figure out how we, how we engage so that everyone can speak what it is they're actually concerned about while they contribute to the organization that they're they're involved in and the same thing with our audience is listening to our audience um, we had we did our first August Wilson up the hill now other theaters across the country are like you're wow that's revolutionary for you it was our first all black cast on the hill a thousand seat audience right um, Walking down the hill with my amazing audience was people saying, oh my gosh, I love that writing. What an amazing writer. What he is, he's a brilliant writer, right? I hope he wrote more plays. And I'm like, wow, okay, yeah, he did. We have to do them all now. So it, it's just, it's that kind of learning and listening and trying to be humble and, and, and not getting so afraid that you just want to stop and disengage. Because every day I have moments of that, every day. So uh, that's just not going to happen. There is great fear and makes people uncomfortable. And I often say, well, as a person of color in this country, the only way to get comfortable is to move through being uncomfortable. You can't get comfortable if you can't move through being uncomfortable. Christina, can you offer a little bit on what you guys are doing? <laughs> yes. What's well, we're doing a lot of examining of self, um, a lot of that self-reflection, and really making sure we know what we're, we're really fully dealing with. And I think sometimes an organization needs to take a deep, deep, hard look and see what they've been doing, how they have been perpetuating systems that are not what we want to be a part of and start figuring out how to uh, take the thing that people are most afraid of doing, giving away their power and give away your power, give it to others, share it, make sure people have their voices heard. Uh, we're doing a lot of things to shift what we're doing. Um, some of you know, we've switched over and we have a place called The Shop now. The whole point of it is to be community forward and handing over that space to others to work with um, and really shifting our perspective on what we do and why we do it. it. Very much to Brenda's point, that fear of somebody worried about having a job Honestly, as she also said before, the more we do to diversify what we're doing, make ourselves more accessible and more inclusive, we serve more people, we do more, we have 
greater outcomes for everyone. And it just, you know, it brings up everyone. And, and I think that getting over that fear is, is always the challenge with an organization and also being an organizational leaders as everyone is on this call and, and really helping them get past the fear to open up for everything and everyone. I am hopeful by all your comments because I often think that only a CEO can solve a problem. Can't be middle management, come up to the CEO and explain the situation. A CEO sees a problem in a job, in a, in a, in a company, he or she can solve it. And that's where we are right now. So thank you three so much for your time. We're running about one o'clock. I wanna be diligent about stopping at one, but I don't know, Sarah, do we have any questions in the chat that? Anybody's asking, Beth Keeley, you're outstanding. Christina, thank you so much. Brenda, Joe, I can't wait until we can see each other in person. It'll be so nice. But are there any questions, Sarah, that we have? Nope, Mark, there are no questions right now, but we also didn't let people know they could ask them. So if there is one or two questions, we could probably fit them in. So if you do have a question, feel free to pop it in the chat right now. Or if not, certainly go to their websites and contact them. They are accessible. You can be reached anytime, 24 seven, right? You all said? <laughs> all right. Mid Christina wants to call at midnight, so we'll make sure we do that. Please do. I'm usually up. <laughs> awesome. Still no questions, but lots of thank yous uh, to everyone. Uh, and I'll just reiterate that. Thank you so much. This conversation was really great. A Thank couple you. things before we end. I do want to make that announcement that what's going to be happening in Dane County, uh, they got the $6 billion to the state from the federal COVID fund relief. Uh, it's finally trickled down to the state. It's finally trickled down to the county. And the county uh, last week made an initial announcement that $1 million will be, add, add, add $1 million will be allocated to Dane Arts to support independent working artists living and working in Dane County. 400 artists will receive $2,500 to support themselves due to the pandemic because of the loss of income related to the pandemic. And they're also working at additional millions of dollars for nonprofits would include arts organizations. So tomorrow, May 1st, go to the Dane Arts website, read more about this possibility. The board votes May 20th to approve this. I see no reason they won't. This is federal funds and we'll get those dollars out as soon as possible. Sign up for our newsletter at danearts.com. Stay involved with Dane Arts. If there's anything Dane Arts can do to help you on any level, we'll do our best to do that. And our Dane Arts by Local Market is coming back after being on a hiatus last year. November 6th, Saturday, Garver Feed Mill will be our Dane Arts by Local Market. Thank you all for joining us today. I do so appreciate. We have one more session that'll be in mid-May with a recap and roundtable of all the participants from the past year. Have a great day. It's going to snow later, but get outside what? now while you can. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Stay cool. Our, I guess.